Bond probably never has been as big as he was during the mid 60s and because the movies have been so successful and influential it spawned a huge spy craze. Bond was a sure thing at the box office so everybody wanted to jump on the bandwagon and make spy movies. A producer by the name of Feldman, who held the current rights to the novel of Casino Royale, even made a James Bond comedy spoof in 1967. It starred David Niven as James Bond along with Peter Sellers and Woody Allen, who also played James Bond in it. Yeah, the movie actually had several James Bond starring in it, along with a lot of different directors who each just filmed a part of the movie without really knowing what the overall storyline was, if there ever was one. It's one of the weirdest, most ridiculous films ever made. It did star Ursula Andress too though. But of course Eon Productions were also going to release their next official instrument in the Bond franchise. So what were they going to do next? There never really was that much continuity in the Bond movies. Even the novels were kind of standalone Bond adventures, but every diehard Bond fan knows that the novels Thunderball, On Her Majesty's Secret Service and You Only Live Twice formed a trilogy that have to be read in that order. And originally the filmmakers wanted to include this in the movies as well, as they had previously already done Thunderball, they wanted to do On Her Majesty's Secret Service next. But the movie required filming in Switzerland and supposedly because there was little snow during that period it didn't go through and they decided to go with You Only Live Twice first. And so far they didn't film any of the novels in order anyway. You Only Live Twice became the first Bond movie in the series to be only loosely based on the official novel. Famous writer Roald Dahl actually wrote the screenplay and drastically changed the original plot. One of the things they did remain faithful to though was the setting taking place in Japan. And filming in Japan wasn't easy, there was so much hype around Bond at that time that the press was everywhere. And some of them even took pictures when Sean Connery was sitting on the toilet, which really pissed him off. And Connery became a bit fed up with the role of James Bond, he was growing more negative towards it. He felt he had helped make Bond successful tremendously, but received way too little of all the money that the movies had made. He also wanted to focus on the rest of his career and wanted to do other projects, so he had announced that this was going to be his final outing in the role of James Bond. To direct the movie, the producers had turned to Lewis Gilbert, who first declined the job, but when Cubby Broccoli called him up and told him he would turn down the largest audience in the world by doing this, apparently he agreed and then he accepted. You Only Live Twice became yet another massive success in the Bond franchise, one that has been very influential and is the most parodied. So how good do I think this movie is? Let's now talk about the movie itself. The gun barrel music already gives us a small hint that Bond will be going on an oriental adventure in this one. The movie starts out in space, where a US space capsule called Jupiter 16 is orbiting the Earth. One of the astronauts is outside to make some repairs, when suddenly a huge unidentified object closes in and swallows Jupiter 16 like a snake eating a mouse. 
And this entire opening always really reminds me of the classic show Thunderbirds, which was a product of the mid-60s as well. Since they broadcasted this show in the early 90s too, it was a show I grew up with and hold huge sentimental value for. Even the guy that voiced Scott Tracy in that show makes an appearance in this opening. We've lost all radio contact. We've also lost him on the scope. To one person this is just a random guy talking, but to me this is a sound of pure nostalgia. Anyway, back on Earth, the world nations hold a meeting about this weird event in space, and of course the Americans are all like, I tell you these goddamn commies are behind this, let's put some democracy in their faces, America, fuck yeah. And the Russians are like, Soviet Russia would never waste time on a puny little western ship, comrade. And meanwhile, the British in the middle are depicted as being the most mature nation in the room, even though the British have no real reason to actually be in this room. I mean, seriously, Britain doesn't even have a space program. But yeah, the British claim the unidentified ship came down somewhere in Japan and they have a man nearby in China on the job right now. So then we move to our hero, who is just finishing up on banging a Chinese chick, which later presses a button causing Bond's bat to lever into the wall and then some men bust into the room and shoot the crap out of the bed. Well, at least he died on the job. He'd have wanted it this way. So 007 already died before the opening credits? Yeah, nobody's actually gonna believe that, but it makes for an interesting pre-title sequence, I guess. Meanwhile, we get into the opening sequence, where the song is performed by none other than Frank Sinatra's daughter, Nancy Sinatra. I really like this song, the music that goes with it is very memorable and to a more modern audience this might seem familiar as it was later used for the Robbie Williams song Millennium. Yeah, that song actually came from a Bond movie, folks. So after the opening credits, we witness Bond's funeral taking place at sea. His body is in this body cast and he is taken to the bottom of the ocean. And I originally thought Bond was going to survive in this movie, but he actually died. So this became the only Bond movie in the franchise not to star Bond, but Felix Leiter instead. Nah, just kidding. Bond is brought into the British Navy submarine and is alive and well. Request permission to come aboard, sir. Permission granted. Thank you. And I like this change of locale here. Moneypenny's office is actually completely remade in this submarine, and so is M's office, who is wearing his admiral clothes, which I thought was pretty cool. So it was revealed that the whole killing of Bond was just a setup to let his enemies believe that he died so that Bond can get onto his mission undetected, which is a pretty cool concept. So he is sent out to Japan to meet with a contact and find out more about the disappearance of the US spaceship. So here we are in Japan, the land of the sushi, anime, men with octopus fetishes and Nintendo. Bond goes to this sumo wrestling match where he meets his contact, Aki, and the code word he has to use as the opening line is quite amusing. I love you. I have a car nearby. Oh, where do you suggest we go? I know a quiet hotel. So Aki drives Bond around town in her Toyota and takes him to his British contact, Henderson, played by Charles Gray. And the whole scene is pretty amusing as Bond uses a stick to slap his leg to see if he truly has a false leg, which we as the audience didn't know about. And Henderson explains that Russia definitely wasn't behind the disappearance of the US spaceship and neither was Japan. And then suddenly he stops talking. Concern. It Yeah, I guess that's definitely one of the downsides to living in a house with paper walls. So Bond quickly follows the guy, takes him down, takes the man's clothes and poses as him acting all injured while he gets into the getaway car to see where that leads him to. He is taken to Osato Industries where he reveals himself to the driver and a quick fight emerges between the two which is pretty good with Bond using a couch and all that stuff and it's all taking place on another great Can-Anim film set. 
After killing the guy, he hides the body in some closet and takes some vodka. He also notices a secret safe, so of course Bond just happens to carry a high-tech safe cracker in his pocket. I mean, you never see Bond go like, shit, brought the breeding operator, should've brought the safe cracker. So he obtains some documents and a film negative in the safe when some guards come in and Bond manages to make a funny but clever escape and then he's picked up by Aki in her Toyota again. Aki drives to an abandoned subway station and suddenly runs off so Bond starts following her and walks straight into a trap and in true Thunderbirds fashion he is brought to the secret office of Tiger Tanaga, head of the Japanese secret service voiced by the same guy who voiced Emilio Largo in the previous movie. I am so very pleased to meet you Bonsan. If you're Tanaka, how do you feel about me? I love you. I'm glad we got that out of the way. <laughs> and he definitely becomes one likable ally in this movie. So Bond gives Tiger the stuff he found in the safe of Osato Industries to be examined. So Tiger takes him to his private subway. Yeah, this guy actually has a private subway. Very convenient. I imagine that your Mr. M in London has a similar arrangement. M? Oh yes, but of course. So the documents that Bond found in the safe reveal some details on the smuggling of liquid oxygen used for rocket fuel and the film negative reveals the photo of a ship called the Ningpo that actually also has a micro dot on it when zooming in. Enlarge. Holy shit! Now that's what I call a high resolution picture. Ah yes, Japanese technology. Super technology! <laughs> And apparently a tourist took this picture and died because of this. Anyway, Bond spends the night at Tanaka's place where we get to learn about some of Japan's finest culture. Rule number one is never do anything for yourself when someone else can do it for you. And number two? Rule number two, in Japan, men always come first, women come second. I might just retire to here. Yeah, they really did a terrific job selling Japan. What a nice place. I think I will enjoy very much serving under you. Okay, I'm now definitely considering to move to Japan. So the next day, Bond goes to Osato Industries again and poses as a businessman, Mr. Fisher, to negotiate to buy chemicals or whatever. Here we meet Mr. Osato himself, along with his secretary, Helga Brand, who is nothing more than a Fiona Volpe 2.0, but just not half as good. When Helga goes up to the closet to get a drink, Bond notices that the body he stashed there the other night is already gone and the damage in the room is also completely repaired, so obviously these people seem to know who he is. He also has this special x-ray desk which allows him to see Bond is armed. Super technology! <laughs> As Bond leaves Osato Industries, Aki once again shows up to quickly rescue Bond from Osato's men and a car chase follows. There isn't too much to say about this car chase, it's one of the more forgettable car chases in the franchise, but it does end with a nice touch as Aki phones in the Japanese secret service to send in a helicopter with a huge magnet to just dispose of the car trailing them that way. And to make it even more hilarious, Bond can follow all of this on the monitor in the back of the car. I mean, how the hell is he able to see this? Which camera is actually filming the helicopter? Sony technology! <laughs> Tiger suggests to go out and investigate at the Kobe docks where the Ningpo ship is docked. And Bond asks Tiger to contact M and bring in little Nelly and her uncle. And at this point it's not yet revealed what that means. So Bond snoops around the Kobe docks and finds out that the smuggled rocket fuel is there, which they already knew, so there's no real reason for him to investigate here if you think about it, but it's used as an excuse to put in some more action of the dock workers attacking and trailing Bond, filled with some impressive aerial shots and some good music. But it all ends with Bond getting caught and he's taken aboard the Ningpo ship where Helga Brand is going to torture him. I've got you now. Well, enjoy yourself. 
and the scene is quite amusing as Bond tries to bribe Helga Brand to escape together and Helga seems to fall for his charms and suddenly starts kissing him and Connery is just casually rolling along with this hilariously and he eventually he thinks, ah, you know, might as well. All the things I do for England. So Helga takes Bond aboard this plane, presumably to escape, but of course she traps Bond and jumps out of the plane. He would have thought that Bond, I don't know, would have noticed that huge parachute on her back or something. And the more you think about it, why the hell do they go out and kill Bond in such an over-the-top way? She could have just killed him before on the ship, now they're wasting an entire expensive plane just to kill him. But yeah, it doesn't really make the movie less enjoyable, of course. And Bond manages to survive with an emergency landing and gets out just before the plane explodes, because, you know, he is Bond. Back at Tiger's place, Aki is glad to see Bond is safe and sound, and Tiger warns him that his love for women could one day kill him. He wouldn't, that's a horrible girl. You wouldn't, would you? Oh, heaven forbid. <laughs> Always found that line to be hilarious, good old Connery. So Bond examines some pictures of the Ningpo ship and notices on one picture the ship isn't fully loaded, so obviously they are using the ship to drop off the rocket fuel somewhere, but they still have no clue where, so then Q shows up and it is revealed to us what little Nelly is, a little tiny heavily armed helicopter, and this thing is badass. I have to point out as a Grand Theft Auto YouTuber that the little Willy helicopter was based on this thing. Yeah, that thing actually came from a Bond movie, folks. And Bond launches into the sky with this thing. I mean, this was not just a fake prop. This helicopter was actually functional. It's so ridiculously awesome. So Bond scouts over some peaceful Japanese fishing villages and non-active volcanoes and doesn't really notice anything out of the ordinary until three enemy helicopters show up. And we get to see what this tiny helicopter is capable of as it has machine guns, heat-seeking missiles, mines and even a fucking flamethrower all done with the barn theme in the background it's one of my favorite scenes in the movie Meanwhile, the Russians have also launched their spaceship into space, and much like the US Jupiter 16, this one also gets captured by the mysterious hijacking unidentified ship. And of course, now the Russians blame the Americans, causing tension between the two nations, and that could all instigate World War III. But this time we actually get to see where this thing came from, and it is revealed that this thing is taken to a secret lair inside one of the non-active volcanoes. And this is one of Ken Adams' most ambitious film sets he ever designed for the franchise. I mean, it's so huge, it has a launch platform for the shuttle, a working monorail system, and a moving hatch on top of the volcano, again really reminding me of the Thunderbirds. This film set alone cost around a million dollars, which was a big deal at the time. I mean, this whole set cost just as much as the whole first James Bond movie, Dr. No, costed in total. It's just amazing. And of course, it's revealed that it is all one big operation of Spectre who is behind all this. Which, of course, is no real surprise, as they pretty much have been featured in all Bond movies so far, except for Goldfinger. So it's revealed that Osato and Helga also work for them, as Osato was responsible for delivering the rocket fuel. And of course, again, we get the faceless number one stroking his white cat while he oversees all of this and presses buttons to kill Helga for failing to kill Bond, and she is dropped into his pool of piranha fish. All classic Bond villain stuff here. Meanwhile, Tiger has taken Bond to this Japanese temple that also serves as a secret ninja training camp. And Tiger plans to use an army of ninjas to infiltrate a fishing village on the island where the Ningpo last made port. We are also introduced here to some Japanese gadgets, like a cigarette that fires a rocket. Nicotine technology! It can save your life, this cigarette. You sound like a commercial. <laughs> 
And this is also where the most ridiculous event of the movie takes place. Bond gets a makeover to look like a Japanese man. And I know they actually took this from the novel to have Bond disguised as an Asian and all that stuff. But in the movie the whole thing just falls flat and has no real significance in the plot. I don't care how much you change Connery's haircut or how much makeup you're gonna use. He will just end up looking like a big 6 foot 2 Scotsman in pajamas. Just completely laughable. I'm Sorry. Anyway, Bond spends the night with Aki when a ninja sneaks in. Yeah, I guess that's definitely one of the downsides of having a house with movable plates as a roof. And he tries to poison Bond, proving that the disguise clearly didn't work as the enemies are well aware who he is. But Aki is killed instead for no real reason. So to further go into Bond's cover-up, he has to do this fake marriage with a Japanese woman. I mean, Bond's gotta bang someone by the end of this movie and with Aki now dead and all so the movie kind of jokes about the brides that Bond gets to choose. There's no way in hell I'm gonna get married. Oh hell no. Oh, what now? Oh come on this is even worse. Oh splendid. Hey Tiger can you marry us today? Of course he chooses the pretty one by the name of Kissy Suzuki. Yeah, that's actually the leading Bond girl's name, and she's pretty interchangeable with Aki. Now, I don't mean to say that all Asians look alike or anything, but these two Asians look alike. So, Tiger Bond and his new wife arrive in the quiet fisherman's village. <laughs> Yeah, they'll definitely never notice that he's a western man. As a supposed married couple settles in on the island, Tiger warns Bond that the Americans are launching another spaceship with a warning to the Russians. If something happens to this one, they will declare war. Fortunately, Kissy heard about a cave on the island where some girl mysteriously died, and the cave is used to deliver the rocket fuel and there's a poisonous gas released to keep unwanted visitors away, which explains the death of that girl. So Bond and Kissy swim underwater, enter the cave and find out it leads up to the top of the volcano. And when one of those helicopters fly by, as Bond and Kissy pretend to be all married and such, it suddenly drops down in the volcano and as the pair finally make their way up to the volcano they discover the lake is actually a metal cover that hides the secret base so Bond sends Kissy back to Tiger to get his men. Wait so she has to go all the way back down there to get Tiger? What happened to all their super technology? During the whole movie they had all kinds of advanced ways they could even bring in a giant helicopter with a giant magnet but yeah never mind. She goes all the way back to get Tiger and his men and Bond sneaks into the lair using his new ninja skills. So he sneaks aboard the monorail system and makes his way over to the imprisoned astronauts and frees them. Bond also takes down one of the Spectre astronauts and dresses up as one of them and gets in line to get aboard the hijacking space shuttle. So wait, Bond is actually gonna go to space? Well yeah, but not in this movie. But number one stops Bond from going into the rocket and Bond is taken to the command center. And as Bond takes off his helmet, notice how his hair is all back to normal. Wasn't he supposed to be in his Japanese disguise? That's what I meant with the whole thing having no real significance. As if the movie completely forgets about it. Anyway, it's here that number one reveals his face. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Ernst Stavro Blofeld. They told me you were assassinated in Hong Kong. Yes, this is my second life. You only live twice, Mr. Bond. Donald Pleasance plays Blofeld, Bond's arch nemesis, one of the most iconic and most parodied villains in the franchise. I'm sure you've seen more villains in other franchises stroking cats and perhaps the most famous Blofeld imitation is Dr. Evil from the Austin Power series. Yeah, all of that stuff came from a Bond movie, folks. But despite him being so iconic, objectively Donald Pleasant really has no real menace. He comes off as just a cartoony tiny man ordering his men around. In retrospect, he honestly ends up being the weakest of all the main villains of the Bond movies of the 60s. 
So the hijacking space shuttle is launched and soon makes its way over to the American spaceship and this will all instigate World War 3. And meanwhile Bond uses his new cigarette gadget as an escape and Tiger and his army of ninjas show up in the crater and a huge battle between the ninjas and the Spectre goons breaks out. I should also mention that there is a henchman in this movie by the name of Hans who I almost forgot about since he's just a generic strong blonde guy, but Bond does briefly fight him in Blofeld's quarters and ends up throwing him in the pool of piranha fish. Meanwhile the battle between the ninjas and the spectre goons continues and it's actually quite unique how Tiger, the leader of the Japanese secret service is there with all his men risking his life. Imagine if M were to do something like that. And of course Bond manages to destroy the hijacking spacecraft just before it can swallow the US space shuttle and the world is saved from a third world war. And Blofeld triggers his self-destruct detonator and shoots Osado. He also tries to shoot Bond but that is prevented by Tiger. But he manages to escape becoming the first main villain not to die in a Bond movie. So everybody quickly escapes the volcano before it explodes and in the water much like the end of Thunderbolt we get these rescue rafts and of course Bond ends up with Kissy in one of them. Lava? So now all of a the sudden there was lava in that volcano? Yeah, anyway, the movie ends how you expect it to end, and the British sub services right underneath Bond and Kissy, and we get a happy ending. You only, you only Live Twice is the movie where some fans claim the franchise reached its first point of absurdity and just went too much over the top. Which is true, but that doesn't mean it's a bad movie. In fact, I consider it to be a classic. Sure, the plot falls apart when you throw logic against it, but to me they got the over the top part completely right. This movie is primetime 60s fantasy. In the movies of today you couldn't get away with a menacing villain stroking his white cat with his pool of piranha fish inside an hollowed out volcano anymore, but back then people wanted that type of escapism and I just love it. Some people complain that Connery looked so bored in the role of Bond in this movie, which is true, there are indeed parts where Connery just looked like he rather would be doing something else, but I honestly never got too bothered by all of that, for some reason. But yes, there is no denying that he definitely gave one of his more weaker performances in this movie, especially compared to his first three outings. The little Nelly was one of the highlights to me in this movie too. Tiger Tanaga was a good and likable ally and I thought Donald Pleasant's Blofeld was a bit cartoony but he's definitely very memorable. The Bond girls however are among the weakest in the franchise so far. Aki at least got to do something noteworthy and Kissy, well, uh, I guess she did look hot roaming around in her bikini in that volcano lair but Overall, they did fit well with the overall feel of the movie and that is something that is done very, really well in this movie. The Japanese atmosphere, the fantasy elements and the way the movie keeps you entertained from start to finish. To me it's one hell of a Bond adventure that should always be considered a classic and that's why it managed to make it into my personal top 10 Bond movies.